Okay, so welcome to this video. I wanted to make this for you to have while I am away so that you don't miss me too much, uh, but that you can have this to read along so that you don't get behind in the reading. And the my, I, my hope is that you can finish Act 3 and go through Act 4, and then when I return um, the week after, the uh, week of the 9th through the 13th that will finish Act 5 together. Um, so we'll have both of these knocked out and we can keep going and not fall behind. Um, in class on Wednesday, we left off with Act 3, Scene 1. So we should be ready to go on with Act 3, Scene 2. Um, so if you have this book, the one that I'm using, um, I'm beginning on page 91. Uh, what I have planned is that you'll finish Act 3 and Act 4, and then I have, um, you'll do a finish your squid on Act 2, and then you'll do one on Act 3. And then I also have um, an online quiz that you're gonna do on Act 4. Um, just to be sure that you got through the reading and you will be able to the online quiz you'll be able to see what you made after as soon as you as you take it um, and so but if you have any questions or anything you can of course email me because uh, I'm actually going to be out of town I will be in Australia this next week um, and but you know internet works around the world these days so you can still email me and I will be able to to get it um, so I am going to read along with you and uh, I hope that you'll follow along with the reading because I think it helps to have someone read it aloud so you can, it just that oral uh, uh, sense with the, the visual just helps to have someone else go along. I think that has helped us in the classroom and I think just being able to continue doing doing this and I'll try not to stop too many times and um, say little side notes just so that we get through it but I just I really I really believe this just um, helps us as we go along um, where we left off on Wednesday was we had finished with the that idea of deceiving Benedict with by the prince and Claudio. So they're trying to make, give, put in Benedict's mind that idea of Beatrice falling in love with him. Remember they were out in the um, Ar Arboretum when he was uh, in the tree area. Uh, if you've seen the movie, it makes sense because he said, I will hide in the arbors, uh, in the trees. And so there he's lurking about and they deceive him to think that Beatrice has fallen in love with him. And then when we get to scene two or act one, act three, scene one, they've done the same thing with Beatrice and they have made Ursula and Hero have made Beatrice think that Benedict has fallen in love with her. And they both willingly accept that news so quickly. They think, oh my goodness, you know, that she says at, at the end on page 91, Beatrice says, and Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness will incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reportingly. She says, just love on, love I am more than willing to return your love. You have given it so freely to me. I, I will turn around and give it back to you. And these are two people that have sworn not to love each other at all. And they will, they have turned right around. And have, have, I mean, they have instantly changed their opinions, um, which tells us that they had that opinion. You know, they had that thought deep down in, in the first place. Um, so we begin... Um, with the, the second scene of Act 3, Benedict appears to have his beard shaved off. 
and showing other signs of having fallen in love. So, fellas, if you are fully in love, that is your first telltale sign. If you're going to, you know, show up to your new gal, you know, make sure you shave that beard off, have a good, you know, clean shaven face, that's the telltale sign. If you don't, then, you know, keep that five o'clock shadow. When he exits with Leonardo, Don John tells Don Pedro, the prince, and Claudio, that hero is unfaithful. So we had that overarching theme, that trick of, that we knew Don John was going to play, but now it is going to come to fruition, and he will show them a man entering her chamber window that very night, the night before the wedding. Okay, so, and, and here in this next scene, they're really going to, have a have a lot of jabs poke fun at Be benedict and you can't you can't really blame them because that he has he has made such a stink for so long um about being a bachelor so they're going to have to have a little fun with him about changing his ways and you know going off and you know shaving his beard and all of this kind of stuff for so long so the prince says I do but stay till your marriage be consummate and then go I toward Aragon. So the prince is saying, I will stay a little while, you know, until you've consummated the marriage. It's official. And then I'll leave. I'll make my leave. And Claudio says, I'll bring you thither, my lord, if you'll vouchsafe me. And the prince says, nay, that would be a great, as great a soil in the new gloss of your marriage as to show a child his new coat and forbid him to wear it. I will only be bold with Benedict for his company. For him, the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, he is all mirth. He has twice or thrice cut Cupid's bowstring, and the little hangman dare not shoot at him. He had the heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper. For what his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. So everything he thinks, he says. And Benedict says, Gallants! I am not as I have been. And Leonardo says, so say I. He thinks you are sadder. And Claudia says, I hope he be in love. And the prince, hang him, truant. There's no drop of blood in him to be truly touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. Benedict, uh, I have the toothache. So he's not going to let on that it's actually he's in love. He can't give that away. He doesn't want them to know. Prince says, draw it. Benedict, hang it. Claudio, you must, fir you must hang it first and draw it afterwards. So they're acting like it is a toothache. And so they're going to play on words here. And the prince says, what? Sigh for the toothache? And Leonardo, where is but a humor or a worm? And Benedict, well, everyone can master a grief, but he that has it. And Claudio, yeah, say I, he is in love. And the prince, there is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be a fancy that he hath to strange disguises, as to be a Dutchman today, a Frenchman tomorrow, or in the shape of two countries at once, as a German from the waist downward, all slops, and a Spaniard from the hip upward, no doublet, unless he hath a fancy to his foolery, as it appears he hath. He is no fool for fancy, as you would have it appear he has. If he not be in love, says Claudio, with some woman, there is no believing old signs. He brushes his hat o' mornings. What should that bode? So Claudio saying, he gives us signs. And the prince Hath any man seen him at the barber's? Hmm. Claudio, no. But the barber's man has seen has been seen with him, and the old ornament of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. So his beard has already been taken off and has been used to stuff tennis balls. They're already using that old hair clippings to stuff something. So indeed. He looks younger than he did by the loss of a beard. And the prince says, nay. He rubs himself with civet. Can you smell him out by that? So he's, he's been using some kind of cologne or something. 
That's as much to say the sweet youth's in love, says Claudia Prince. The greatest note of it is his melancholy. And Claudio, and when he was wont to wash his face, Prince, yay, or to paint himself, for the which I hear what they say of him. Claudio, nay, but his jesting spirit, which is now crept into a lute string and now governed by stops. Prince, indeed, that tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude. He's in love. Claudio, nay, but I know who loves him. Prince, that would I know too. I warrant one that knows him not. And Claudio says, yes, and his ill conditions, and in despite of all, dies for him. And the prince says, she shall be buried with her face upwards. And Benedict, yet is this no charm for the toothache? Old Signor, walk aside with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak with you, which these hobby horses must not hear. I want to talk to you, but I don't want these old fools to hear it. And the prince says, for my life to break with him about Beatrice. And Claudia says, tis even so. Hero and Margaret have by this played their parts with Beatrice, and then the two bears will not bite one another when they meet. So they have set the hook, and he has taken the bait. Now enter John the Bastard. Don John, my lord and brother, God save you. Prince, Good even, brother. Don John, if your leisure serve, I would speak with you. And the prince says, in, in private? And he says, if it please you, yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. And the prince says, what's the matter? And he says to Claudio, means your lordship to be married tomorrow? And the prince says, you know he does. And Don John says, I know not that when he knows what I know. And Claudio says, well, if there be any impediment, I pray you discover it. Don John says, you may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter and aim better at me that I will now manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well and in dearness of heart hath hoped to effect your ensuing marriage. Surely suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. The prince says, why, what's the matter? John John says, I came hither to tell you, and circumstances shortened, for she has been too long a talking of. The lady is disloyal. Claudia says, who? Hero? And Don John says, even she, Leonato's hero, your hero, every man's hero. Claudia says, disloyal? Don John says, the word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Think you of a worse title and I will fit her to it. Wonder not till further warrant. Go but with me tonight, you shall see her chamber window entered, even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her, but it would better fit your honor to change your mind. And, the, and Claudio says, may this be so? And the prince says, I will think, I will not think it. Don John says, if you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. And Claudio, if I see anything tonight, why I should not marry her tomorrow in the congregation where I should wed, there will I shame her. The prince says, and as I wooed for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. John, Don John says, I will disparage her no farther till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly, but till midnight and let the issue show itself. The prince says, O oh, day untowardly turned. Claudio, O oh, mischief strangely thwarting. Don John, O oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel? Okay, so they exit. Now, this is where it takes a weird turn to me. So you've had somebody 
you're going to be married to, the love of your life, even though you've known them only a week, maybe you've known of them for a little longer, maybe a year or whatever before you went to war. What would the logical conclusion be to do if you're gonna marry this person? That's right, Hugh. That's what I thought. You would go talk to them. Maybe you would, maybe. I don't know. What, who would know what you would do? I don't know. Conrad, maybe you should talk some sense into him. I don't know. But maybe you should go talk to them to try to sort this out. But the biggest jumping to conclusion thing that you could do is to fly off the handle, go there and try to shame her, publicly disgrace her. Well, let, let's hope that you would not do that. I don't, I don't know. You never know what goes through your mind. But if, the, maybe in today's time, I don't know. This, there was such a huge bout or theme of upholding one's reputation and honor that you had to. It was imperative that your reputation not be soiled or unkempt. So they are going to automatically jump to conclusions. There's no doubt. We will not even ask her. We will not, because I mean, you could, he could have gone up and said, hey babe, what, what's the deal? Could you not, could you tell me, you know, have you been seeing him behind my back? Do you not want to get married? It's no, you whore, you slut. I mean, it's, let's just jump to the worst case scenario. So with scene three, we get our beginning of the comedy relief that we see here with Dogberry um, and his partner, Virgis, and the little watchman. So um, they are going to be, even though they are going to appear to be very, very, very incompetent on the outside, they are actually going to be the ones that are going to be able to untangle this little mess that we are now getting ourselves into. So that night, Messina's master constable, Dogberry, and his assistant, Virgis, set the night watch, telling the watchman to pay particular close attention to any activity around Leonardo's house. Baraccio encounters telling his companion, Conrad, about the charade that made Claudio and Don Pedro think that Hero had just allowed him to enter her chamber. Baraccio and Conrad are arrested by the watch. And Conrad is one, I mean, not Conrad, Dogberry is one that he loves to use, he likes to use superfluous words, but he uses them in the wrong context. And he often misunderstands things in the wrong way also. So Dogberry says, are you good men and true? And Virgis says, yay or else it were pity, but they should suffer salvation, body and soul. And Dogberry, nay, that were a punishment too good for them, if they should have any allegiance in them being good, chosen for the prince's watch. And Virgis, well, give them their charge, neighbor Dogberry. And Dogberry, first, who think you the most desertless man to be constable? And the first watchman, Hugh O'Cake, okay, sir, or, George Seacole, for they can write and read. Dogberry, come hither, neighbor Seacole, and he steps forward. God hath blessed you with a good name. To be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. And he says, both which, Master Constable, Dogberry, you have. I knew it would be your answer. Well, for you favor, sir, why God gives thanks. And make no boast of it. And for your writing and reading, let you appear when there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be most senseless, and of course, not senseless, and fit man for the constable of the watch. Therefore, bear you the lantern. This is your charge, and you shall comprehend all vagrom men, and not vagrom, vagrant men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. And see, Cole, how if he will not stand. And Dogberry says, well, then take no note of him, 
but let him go. And presently, call the rest of all the watch together and thank God you are rid of a knave. And a knave is a, like a, a he's going to be um, like a vagrant, someone who is going to be um, someone who is an ill fellow, basically, um, who is doing wrong on the loose. Verges, if he will not stand when he is bidden, he is none of the prince's subjects. And Dogberry says, true. And if they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects, you shall also make no noise in the streets. For, for the watch to babble and to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. And so we're using tolerable and not to be endured. He's all mixed, all mixed up. We will rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. And he says, why you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend, only have a care that your bills be not stolen. Well, you are to call at all the L houses and bid them, bid those that are drunk, get them to bed. How, if they will not? Why then let them alone till they are sober. And if they make you not, then the better answer, for may say that they are not the men you took them for. And C. Cole says, well, sir, and he says, if you meet a thief, you may suspect him, but virtue of your office to be no true man, and for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why, the more is for your honesty. And C. Cole says, if we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? And, he, and Dogberry says, truly by your office you may, but I think they that touch pitch will be defiled. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. So what he's doing is making no sense whatsoever. The only way he can show you that he is a thief is to steal from you, which negates the whole thing. And Virgis says, you have always been, you have been always called a merciful man, partner. And Dogberry says, truly, I will not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. And Virgis says to the watch, if you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her steal it. And the second says, how if a nurse be asleep and will not hear us? And Dogberry says, why then depart in peace and let the child wake her with crying? For that you that will not hear the lamb when it baths will never answer a, ca a calf when he bleats. And Virgis says, tis very true. And Dogberry, this is the end of the charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you must stay him. Virgis, nay, by our lady, that I think he cannot. Dogberry says, five shillings to one on it, and with any man that knows the statutes, he may stay him. Mary, not without the prince's be willing, for indeed the watch ought to offend no man, and it is an offense to stay a man against his will. And Virgis, by our lady, I think it be so. And Dogberry, ah, ha, ha, well, masters, good night. And there be any matter of weight, chances, call up me. Keep your fellows counsel and your own. And good night, come, neighbor. So Dogberry and Virgis begin to exit, but C. Cole says, well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench until two and then all to bed. And Dogberry says, one more word, honest neighbors, I pray you about watch about Signor Leonardo's door. For the wedding being there tomorrow, there is a great coil tonight. Adieu. Be vigilant. Vigilant, not vigilant. I beseech you. And so they exit. Now, Baraccio and Conrad. And Baraccio says, what Conrad? And see Cole to the side. Peace, stir not. And Baraccio, Conrad, I say, and he says, here, man, I am at thy elbow. And Baraccio says, mass, and my elbow itch. I thought there would a scab follow. And he, he says, I will owe thee an answer for that. And now forward with thy tail. And Baraccio says, stand thee close, then under this penthouse, for it drizzles rain. And I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. And Seacol aside says, some treason, masters, yet stand close. Baraccio, therefore no, I have earned of Don John a thousand ducats. And Conrad, is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? And Baraccio, thou shouldst rather ask if it were possible any villainy should be so rich. For when rich villains have need of poor ones, poor ones may make what price they will. Conrad, I wonder at it. 
and Barachia, that shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet or a hat or a cloak is nothing to a man. And Conrad, yes, it is apparel. And Barachio, I mean the fashion. Conrad, yes, the fashion is the fashion. Barachio, tush, I may as well say the fool's the fool. But seest that thou, that thou not what a deformed thief this fashion is. And the first watchman aside says, I know that deformed. He has been a vile thief this seven year. He goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. And Barachio, didst thou hear somebody? And Conrad says, no, t'was the vein on the house. And Baraccio, seest thou not, I say, what a deformed thief this fashion is, how giddily he turns about all the hot bloods between 14 and 5 and 30, sometimes fashioning like the Pharaoh's soldiers in the Ricci painting, sometimes like God Bell's priests in the old church window, sometimes like the shaven Hercules in the smirched, worm-eaten tapestry where the codpiece seems as massy in his, as his club. Conrad, all this I see, and I see the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. But art not thou thyself giddy with the fashion too? Art thou hast shifted out of the tail into telling me of the fashion? And Baraccio, not so neither. But know that I have tonight wooed Margaret, the Lady Hero's gentlewoman by the name of Hero. She leans me out at her mistress's chamber windows, bids me a thousand times good night. I tell the tale vilely. I should first tell thee how the Prince Claudio and my master planted and placed and possessed by my master Don John saw afar off in his orchard, orchard this amiable encounter. And Conrad, and thought they, Margaret, was hero? And Baraccio, two of them did, the prince and Claudio. But the devil, my master, knew she was Margaret, and partly by his oaths, which first possessed them, but chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm any slander that Don John had made. Away went Claudio, enraged, swore he would meet her as he was appointed next morning at the temple. And there, before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw overnight and send her home again without a husband. And the first watchman jumps out and says, we charge you in the prince's name, stand. And Seacole, call up the right master constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of lechery ever known in the commonwealth, in the first watchman. And one deformed is one of them. I know him. He wears a lock. And it should have said defamed. And one defamed is one of them. And so Dogberry, masters, masters. And the first watchman, you'll, made, you'll be made bring deformed forth. I warrant you defamed forth. And he says, masters, never speak. We charge you, let us obey you to go with us. And Baraccio says, we are like to prove a goodly commodity being taken up these men's bills. And Conrad says, a commodity in question. I warrant you, come, we'll obey you. So... They were actually out talking about trying to uh, spend money on fashion and all of this kind of stuff because Baraccio had money to burn in his pocket being paid the thousand ducats. And so their big mouths got the better of them and they were overheard by these men, these watchmen. Um, had he not been out bragging, then he could have saved the whole thing and not let the watchman had uh, found out about it. They would not have found out about it, but Baraccio was out running his mouth. Therefore, these crazy little watchmen found out and are able to, but it helps the story to move further along and helps us unravel our knot that we have gotten in. So the last little scene that we have here, um, or the last two scenes that we have here, um, in the, at the end of Act 3. We'll go by um, fairly quickly. Um, early the next morning, Hero prepares for the wedding. Beatrice enters suffering, she says, from a bad cold. Um, and Margaret teases her about being in love with Benedict. Um, so, Hero says, Good Ursula, 
wait my cousin Beatrice and desire her to raise. And Ursula says, I will, lady and hero, and bid her come hither. Ursula, well, Margaret, troth, I think your other ribato were better. Hero, no, pray thee, good Meg, I'll wear this. And Margaret, by my troth's not so good, and I warrant your cousin will say so. Hero, my cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. And Margaret, I like the new tire within excellently. If the hair were a thought browner, and your gown's a most rare fashion, I faith. I saw the Duchess of Milan's gown that praise, that they praise so. And Hero, oh, that exceeds, they say. And Margaret, by my troths, but a nightgown in respect of yours, cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls, down sleeves, side sleeves and skirts, round underborne with a bluish tinsel. But for a fine, quaint, graceful and excellent fashion, yours is worth ten on it. And hero, God give me joy to wear it, for my heart is exceeding heavy. And Margaret, she'll be heavier soon by the weight of a man. And so we have a double entendre here. Um, and hero, fie upon thee, are not ashamed? And Margaret said, of what, lady, of speaking honorably? Is not marriage honorable in a beggar? Is not your lord honorable without marriage? I think you, you would have me say, saving your reverence, a husband, and bad thinking, do not rest true speaking. I'll offend nobody. Is there any harm in the heavier for a husband? None, I think, and it be the right husband and the right wife, of course. Tis light and not heavy. Ask my lady Beatrice else. Here she comes. And so Beatrice is going to come in. And she is, as Benedict did, is going to act like she's not in love because they can't go back and uh, for she doesn't want anybody to know. And Hero says, well, good morrow, cuz. And Beatrice, good morrow, sweet Hero. And she says, why, how now? Do you speak in the sick tune? And Beatrice says, I am out of all other tune, methinks. And Margaret, claps into light of love that goes without a burden. Do you sing it and I'll dance it? And Beatrice, you... Light a love with your heels, then if your husband have stables enough, you'll see he shall lack no barns. And Margaret, oh, illegitimate construction, I scorn that with my heels. Beatrice, tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my troth, I am exceeding ill. Hey ho, Margaret, for a hawk, a horse, or a husband. And Beatrice, for the letter that begins them all, H. Margaret, well, and you be not turned Turk. There's no more, need, more sailing by the star. And she says, what means the fool, Trow? Margaret, nothing. I, but God send everyone their heart's desire. And here are these gloves, the counts in me. They are an excellent perfume. And Beatrice, I, I am stuffed, cousin. I, I cannot smell. And Margaret says, a maid and stuff. There's goodly catching of cold. And Beatrice, oh, God help me. God help me. How long have you professed apprehension? And Margaret says, ever since you left it, doth not my wit become me rarely. And Beatrice, it is not seen enough. You should wear it in your cap. By my troth, I am sick. And Margaret, get you some of this distilled Cardus Benedictus and lay it on your heart. It is the only thing for a qualm. And Hero, there's thou prickst her with a thistle. Beatrice says, Benedictus? Why Benedictus? You have some moral in this Benedictus? And she says, moral? No, by my troth, I have no moral meaning. I mean, plain holy thistle. You may think, perchance, that I think you are in love. Nay, by our lady, I am not such a fool to think that I, what I list, nor what, what I list not to think what I can, nor indeed I cannot think. If I would think my heart out of thinking that you are in love, or that you think you will be in love, or that you can't be in love, yet Benedict, 
Benedict was such another, and now he has become a man. He swore he would never marry, and yet now, in despite of his heart, he eats his meat without grudging. And now you may be converted. I know not, but methinks you look with your eyes as other women do. Beatrice, what pace is that, that the, this that thy tongue keeps? Margaret, not a false gallop. And Ursula enters. Madam, withdraw the prince, the count, Signor Benedict, Don John, and all the gallants of the town are come to fetch you to church. And here it says, help me to dress, good cuz, good Meg, good Ursula. And they exit. So they're all so excited. The wedding is impending. And Dogberry in the last scene of Act 3. Dogberry and Virgis try to tell Leonardo about the arrest of Baraccio and Conrad, but they are so unintelligible, they can't even get the message out. And Leonardo is impatiently dismissing them, telling them to examine the prisoners. He leaves for the wedding. He's, I have so much going on, you loons. I don't have time to stop and think about what you are trying to tell me. Just look, I've got a wedding. My daughter is here. I mean, imagine you were trying to get, you know, you're trying to get everything out the door and you've got these little, you know, gnats flying around your head. Look, 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 fellas, just take care of it. Whatever, whatever. I've got to go. I've got to get to the church. So, Leonardo, what what would you have with me, honest, honest neighbor? And Dogberry says, Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. And Leonardo, brief, I pray you, for you see it is a busy time with me. And Dogberry, Mary, this it is, sir. And Virgis, yes, in truth, it is, sir. Leonardo, what is it, my good friends? Dogberry, good man Virgis, sir, speaks a little of the matter. An old man, sir, and his wits are not so blunt as, God help, I would desire they were. But in faith, honest as the skin between his brows. Virgis, yes, I thank God I am as honest as any man living that is an old man and no honester than I and Dogberry. Comparisons are odorous, odorous. Palabras, neighbor Virgis. Le Leonardo, neighbors, you are tedious. Dogberry, it pleases your worship to say so, and he thinks tedious is a compliment. But we are the poor Duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find in my heart to bestow it all of your worship. All thy tedious on me, ah, says Leonardo. Dogbert, yea, and twere a thousand pound more than tis, for I hear as good exclamation on your worship as of any man in the city. And though I be a poor man, I am glad to hear of it. And Virgis, and so am I. Leonardo, I would fain know what you have to say. And Virgis, Mary, sir, on our watch tonight, accepting your worship's presence, hath taken a couple of as errant knaves as any in Messina. Dogberry. A good old man, sir, he will be talking. As they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. God help us, it is the world to see. Well said, in faith, neighbor verges. Well, God's a good man, and two men ride of a horse. One must ride behind, an honest soul in faith. Sir, by my troth he is, as ever broke bread, but God is to be worshipped. All men are not alike. Alas, good neighbor. And Leonardo, indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Dogberry, God gives that God gives. Leonardo, I'm, I must leave you. Dogberry, one word, sir. Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons. Not auspicious, auspicious. And we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Leonardo, take, take their examination yourself and bring it to me. I am in great haste, as it may appear unto you. Dogberry, it, it may be sufficient instead of sufficient. Leonardo, drink some wine before you go. Fare you well. And the messenger, my lord, they stay for you to give your daughter to your husband. Leonardo, I'll wait upon them. I am ready. And so he exits. So Dogberry, go, good partner, go get you to Francis Seco. Bid him bring this pen and inkhorn to the jail. We are now to examination these men. And Virgis, we must do it wisely. And he says, we will spare no wit. I warrant you, here's that shall drive some of them to a non-come 
only to the learned writer to set our excommunication instead of examination and meet and me meet at the jail. So you can see he gets his words completely all mixed up. Um, and Leonardo is just entirely put out. Had he stopped and listened to what Dogberry had to say, um, so much of this could have been thwarted. It could have been um, stopped in ahead of time but no you know it, it sometimes it pays to listen to the little guy even when you think he is a little loony or a little you know off his rocker but you know maybe we'll see all's well that ends well in in the end so you know if you proceed on to act four we will see more of uh turmoil before we see some of the resolution